Putting humans into a hibernation state to make interplanetary journeys has been a staple of science fiction films like Aliens and Passengers. But some people think it might one day become a reality and even a solution to get people to Mars. The only problem? Humans don't hibernate. But bears do in ways that we might one day emulate. It's not unique to one particular class of mammals. And I think as long as those pieces are there in humans, then we could translate that uh, into a situation where hibernation could be induced. That's Heiko Jansen. He studies hibernation in bears. We talked to him about what human hibernation might be like and the ways it could help us hurtle through space or cure our illnesses. So tell us a little bit about what's interesting physiologically about bears and hibernation. Wow, where to start? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> no, it's, um, it, it's really quite an, an amazing physiological state where the bears can survive for months without eating or drinking. Their body temperature when they're hibernating doesn't go that low. Um, it only drops to about 30 to 34 degrees centigrade versus 37. But if you compare that to a ground squirrel, they may drop their temperature to zero or sometimes even below zero. They still reduce their metabolic rate, how much oxygen they consume, how much energy they actually consume by 75%, uh, which is very similar to what's happening in a rodent. They have normal sleep-wake cycles. Um, they're much less active, but they still do stand up and they may move around their den. So um, they're actually, some of us in the barrel world think that bears are actually the most advanced hibernator um, based on all of those abilities. When you're studying hibernation in bears, what does that actually look like? So I'm fortunate that I belong to a group at Washington State University. We have an actual research facility with the sole purpose of trying to understand everything about bear physiology, bear ecology, um, and, and um, wildlife preservation. Uh, we have these captive animals, some which were raised in captivity, others which came from the wild um, as problem bears. And so those animals um, are hibernating um, right now. And um, what we can do is we can go into those dens um, and we can sedate them and we can take blood samples, for example. Um, we can take a small tissue biopsy um, to, to uh, gather the cells that we need uh, for our, some of our cell culture work. Um, we can do a variety of physiological measurements that we want. Is there yeah. also a world in which we learn how to hibernate as humans? Because we know that hibernation evolved in different species over different periods of time, it's not unique to one particular class of mammals. And I think humans potentially have some of the building blocks that we could use to induce hibernation. Because of our body mass, we could not lower our body temperature to the point that a rodent does and be able to rewarm. At this point, I see the bear as being much more closely related to a human type of hibernation. Is there something we can learn about human physiology by studying bear hibernation? Well, I think so. Um, you know, we, we've picked a couple of uh, topics to, to focus on in our bear work, and one of them is um, what's known as insulin resistance. Um, it's something that um, diabetics will experience when their bodies no longer respond to insulin, and so the tissues can't take up the glucose in the bloodstream. Well, bears undergo this process normally when they enter hibernation. And so if we understood the mechanisms whereby they can reverse that insulin resistance once they come out of hibernation, we might be able to apply that to a human situation. The other thing that I think is, is very interesting is this ability to lower the metabolic rate, even though the bears are at a relatively high body temperature. And cancer cells are, are very active metabolically. And so ways in which we could turn down their sort of energetic usage uh, might be a way to, to limit some of the problems associated with, with cancer. Heart rates decrease tremendously during hibernation but the bears don't suffer any cardiovascular problems. They have no loss of bone density. They don't lose any muscle mass in hibernation. So there's a lot of interest in trying to understand in terms of you know, people that are bedridden uh, or in space travel, uh, the loss of muscle mass is considerable, but bears seem to not succumb 
to that, even though they're laying around for about 98% of the day. You mentioned just there the prospect of learning to hibernate as a way to get to Mars. And I think this is one of the sort of interesting applications of hacking human physiology. Um, how would hibernation help with that effort? And, and how do you see that playing out? Yeah, the, the primary benefit there is that it allows us to be able to use a spacecraft that doesn't require carrying all the food that's necessary to bring someone to Mars. The passengers on the spacecraft uh, could actually enter that state of hibernation and so be transported for who knows how long, maybe a couple of months even, without having to eat anything. You'd require less oxygen, so you probably wouldn't need as much oxygen on board. Of course, oxygen is light, so that's not as big an issue. And cool. if we could lower our temperatures, we would save even more energy. What would human hibernation look like and why can't we hibernate already? You would essentially be asleep. Your, your brain activity would be sleep-like, your blood pressure would be lowered, and your, your use of energy, much like what happens during sleep, would also be greatly reduced. Now, when we go to sleep, our metabolic rate drops by about 6% or so, plus or minus. But Hibernation is, is a much deeper level of metabolic suppression, and those are the, the targets and the pathways that we want to try to identify. What makes it possible to go from a 6% reduction in metabolic rate to a 75% reduction in metabolic rate? It may involve some lowering of body temperature, and that's fine. Those kinds of temperatures are actually used now in humans. Uh, for surgeries um, and for um, doing organ preservation and transplantation. We know that, you know, by storing something at a colder temperature actually allows it to actually survive for a, a prolonged period of time. There are, of course, limits to that, but I think the, the principle there is going to be very similar. So is this, is this feasible? I, I think um, once we have a mechanistic uh, picture of what's going on and the genes and the proteins that we identify are there in humans, then I think it is feasible. Um, we don't have a lot of evidence to suggest that hibernation is induced by one particular thing, right? It's not, there's this factor that appears suddenly, the animal goes into hibernation. It's, it's malleable, it's flexible, and it relies on multiple types of events occurring. And I think as long as those pieces are there in humans, then we could translate that uh, into a situation where hibernation could be induced. Now, you know, the question is, would anyone, would we want to hibernate for six months if we weren't going somewhere, right? And I think the answer is no, <laughs> unless it had some, some obvious benefit. Um, and I could envision, for example, you know, maybe someday being able to uh, put someone into a state of hibernation that has a terminal disease and maybe halting the spread of that disease or the development of that disease until a cure is found. You know, these are all more or less science fiction things at this point in time, but I think having that ability would get us one step closer uh, to being able to do those mm -hmm. sorts of things. Um, now, whether all the organs would survive something like that, you know, these are all the questions that remain unanswered. Thinking about humans hibernating seems super science fiction-y. Um, is this a new idea because of the sort of ambition to go to space, or is this something that people have been thinking about for a long time? This idea has been around for a really long time. I mean, you, you mm. see it in, in movies going back to the 50s. <laughs> But what's changed over time is the development of, of molecular genetic um, and, and other tools that allow us or will or potentially could allow us to, to modulate or modify our own physiology. And those kind of things um, back in the day were all science fiction and now they're science fact. And it's wrapped up in a lot of ethical issues, rightfully so, and so we need to be careful um, but I think the basic premise um, has been there for a long time, and I think we just we're getting closer and closer with the development of these tools. And I think by incorporating what we learn from from animals, as we've done so often, uh, we can apply that to humans to great benefit. Who knows where this is going to lead us? Um, we're still at a very basic stage of trying to understand at at the very molecular level what is really going on and what mm -hmm. allows these transitions to occur. And so, you know, taking that information to the next level is going to be a very, 
a very difficult process. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. 